Thank you so much for the opportunity to share our work with you today. Um, and I think we're both looking forward to questions. Um, Casper is going to drive the slides um, because most of the presentation is his. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll just give a quick overview of the project, talk about why the library in particular was involved um, in the project, look at some of the non um, particularly sort of computer vision based um, outcomes and other aspects of the project before I hand over to Casper to go deep and prevent a kind of a presented case study of some of the fantastic work that he's done. So I'm, I hope you really enjoy that. Can I have the next slide, please, Casper? Great, thank you. Um, so just by way of background, um, the project ran for about five years. Um, obviously COVID happened in that time. Um, so we had a very slight extension. Um, its roots are uh, in conversations when the Turing moved into the physical location of the British Library in St Pancras um, and our realisation around 2015, 2016 that methods like big data, machine learning, deep learning, all the various names is had over time, um, uh, eventually becoming data science and then AI, um, were going to be really important for the library to understand, not only in terms of what it could do for providing access to our collections, but also in terms of the kinds of um, things that people would want to do with our collections um, as these methods became more available. So collaborating with the Alan Turing Institute was a fantastic way of drawing on the fact that they were in the building. Um, we have access to digitized collections that come from our collections through public-private partnerships. And then we drew in partner universities um, to come up with a project that um, used new methods, machine learning methods, uh, to look at mechanization in the past. Um, so to understand how people, ordinary people living in Britain in the long 19th century experienced the changes around the coming of mechanization, um, looking at language around that, um, looking at what we could get from different sources. So we're tremendously grateful to the Arts and Humanities Research Council for funding this project, along with um, UKRI. At the time, and probably still now, it's the biggest digital humanities project funded in the UK. So it's really huge, and it took us quite some time to kind of figure out how to manage all the very, very many moving parts. Um, one of the most challenging aspects is that we wanted it to be a radical collaboration across disciplines. So no one discipline in the service of another. Um, for us working in libraries, sometimes people um, might imagine that we take more of a service role. Um, that's not typically how it works. So we're actively engaged in the research and really looking for outcomes that could reflect, um, teach us more about what was coming for the future of libraries as well as um, looking to audiences outside the traditional academic historian, to community historians, local historians, um, in part based on what we know about the people who come in to use our newspaper reading rooms, um, formerly in a site called Collindale and now in the British Library in St Pancras and also outside of Leeds. Um, I think one of the key things to note is that this is a very data intensive project working with digitised sources at scale and the scale really could be um, sort of stupendous. Um, move, even just moving files around could take a long time, as well as negotiating access, managing, um, getting files next to compute, working out really basic things like Azure bills, um, so cloud storage bills, let alone compute bills, um, and managing access to people with different relationships to the project. Next slide, please. Um, so some of our aims were to generate new historical perspectives on um, the mechanization of labor. This is really challenging because the Industrial Revolution, the long 19th century, um, had already been very, very studied. Um, so I think we all found it quite daunting at the start to think about what could we do or say that would be new. Um, and I think Casper will talk something about the, the challenges of digital history and how it's positioned in relation to traditional history um, and whether you can say something new. Um, but we wanted to develop computational techniques for working with historical um, research questions and sources um, to create reusable tools and code. Um, and I'm delighted to say that we have about, I think, over 100 data sets, including some of the stuff that Casper created, 
um, publications and other outputs on the British Library's research repository and 49 or 50 public GitHub repositories with code that have been created through the project and made available for others to use. Um, so we have been able to enrich the British Library starter holdings for the benefit of all. And through things like crowdsourcing, we were able to involve people in the process of annotating historical records to think about what it means to create ground truth for things like machine learning, um, getting a real a hands-on sense of the kind of the actual practical processes that are involved in machine learning and AI, um, and also to share that through um, some book publications and through the project's exhibition in Leeds. Next slide, please, Kasper. So I just wanted to share some of the team. I think over time we had 42 people come through the project in different roles. It was a long project um, and sometimes people moved on to permanent jobs during the project, which is fantastic. Um, so a lot of people contributed and um, we're aligning some of the details in this, but I would really encourage you to go and look at the project's website, the achievements page to get a sense of the huge numbers of people who could contributed in so many different ways to the project. Um, next slide, please. So one of the projects um, that I wanted to share is this idea of rail space. Um, so railway lines, railway infrastructure, trains, etc., cetera, are a really um, sort of evident, uh, obvious form of impact on ordinary lives, on the landscapes um, of Britain. Um, as well as on people's experience of those spaces, experiences of towns. Um, so there was a lot of work and a lot of data created um, around the development of that infrastructure, how it was timed, the impact that it had, how you can look for it at scale. So really um, using the visual signifiers of um, railway infrastructure, as well as text-based records to understand um, the rapid growth of rail um, and how that had an effect on how people experience mechanization and also um, side effects like faster access to goods, to services, to locations. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So MapReader, um, a lot of people really love this project. Uh, it's a pipeline so that you can train computer vision software to understand visual features. Um, it was developed in the project for working with ordnance survey maps in particular, which give you a fantastic sense of how, what the Victorians thought was important to note about a landscape. Once you've trained the software to understand what a, a patch of a map with rail infrastructure looks like compared to ones that don't have railway infrastructure, you can scale up that search for rail infrastructure across the ordnance survey maps that you do have. Um, and excitingly, people have adopted this method of a, a really accessible way of training computer vision um, machine learning algorithm in different domains. So I think biologists, amongst others, have used this. And it's a fantastic example of how the humanities, this came from Katie McDonough and her collaborators, um, who are very much humanities thinkers, but it's made contributions to other sciences as well. Next slide, please, Casper. That's the GitHub repository if you want to believe us that it's all there. Um, so I just wanted to pause briefly and just reflect on why computer vision and maps is such a good match. Um, I think the people who worked on it in particular are really keen to know that it shows how Victorians represented the choices that they made about representing a landscape. As we know, a map is always a reduction of all the information that could be conveyed. Um, so combining this knowledge of maps as a certain form of insight into interests um, that motivated the creation of those, those maps um, with the idea that computer vision can let you scale up that search and that thinking and the creation of data sets really quickly. Um, they were aiming to develop a sort of a humanistic computer vision method um, that always holds close the idea that maps aren't a ground truth, maps are a representation. Um, and lets them remain really close to the source and move quickly through different research questions. And I think one of the, as a personal reflection, one of the challenges of scale on this project is that um, with these methods, you can really quickly come up with 10 new um, research questions and curios curiosities in a single conversation. 
Um, but each of them with the scale of the resources that we have to look through would take time to go through. So I think probably everyone experienced a sense of huge potential, um, but then making hard choices about which um, ideas you actually pursued and kept going through to a final output. Next slide, please, Casper. Um, okay, we spent a lot of time thinking about newspapers, um, partly because one of the motivations of the project was the fact that the British Library had always had theoretical access to um, newspapers that we digitised with Find My Past as part of the British Newspaper Archive, but we'd never had a reason to really use them uh, in earnest and at scale. Um, and we also had a really rare opportunity to digitise new newspapers to make up some of the gaps. Um, one of the fundamental um, drivers for the creation of the British Newspaper Archive is the um, serving the family history and local history market, which is a huge kind of internet market. Um, so they were looking for name rich sources, the kinds of things um, that if you're looking for a name of an ancestor or trying to find out more about a local area, you want the newspapers that mention lots of local people. Um, the newspaper archive began with newspapers chosen by academics to, to fill, to get a representative sense, but it changed a lot over those years. So we spent a lot of time thinking about of all the many, many newspapers. And I think when the project began about 8% were digitized. Um, and at this point between our project, others and the British Newspaper Archive, 11 or 12% of the newspapers in the British Library's collection are digitized. Um, how would we, what were the most useful newspapers to digitize? Um, so we developed, um, Olivia Vane on my team developed a method with others called Press Picker, which looked at the different formats that we had the newspapers in from um, microfilm, physical, um, the dates that the newspaper titles ran because newspapers, um, I always think of them as being a bit like a dot-com startup boom. There were lots of short-lived newspaper titles. Some of them were less short-lived than they might've appeared. They went on to have a new name, they merged, they split. Um, people uh, collaborated or they fell out with each other. Um, so newspaper histories are complex. Um, and we were trying to manage the process of digitizing as effectively as, and efficiently as possible. So we developed some tools for doing that as well. And then um, people in the team spent a lot of time thinking about what this kind of work means um, and how it affects the research that you can do and how you understand a collection. Next slide, please, Casper. Okay, one of the exciting examples, if anyone's done any census research, um, You'll know that tracking people across census records can be particularly hard, particularly for married women who change their name, but also for people who change their occupation, people who are a bit fuzzy about their date of birth, um, their age at the time when the census record was taken. There are issues with how census takers wrote down um, local names um, because they might have just had a phonetic um, answer rather than an actual spelt out answer, so names can get sort of squished. So fantastic work by um, Emma and Josh, Josh in the project, developing methods to algorithmic, algorithmically link people between census records. So doing that um, manual process at scale so that they could understand changes in occupations in response to mechanization. Next slide, please. Um, we also had many linguists on the project um, who were looking at um, the language around these various aspects, including um, understanding when inanimate objects were given, were spoken about as if they were animate um, creatures. Um, so when they were given the attributes of animate um, objects and they developed a lot of really innovative methods for understanding this. Um, and I would encourage you to go and look at the achievements page on the website to find out more about that work. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so finally, I think for me, um, uh, we use the citizen science platform Zooniverse to classify and annotate articles to create data sets for analysis. Um, and spent a lot of time thinking about things like um, place names. It's a really nice example of how fuzzy historical data is when you try and create structured data from it. Um, so the places given for accidents involving machinery might be in a, a given location in a town, 
it might be on the high street and the newspaper doesn't name the town that the high street is in because it's the local newspaper and everybody knows it's in the Preston High Street because it's in the Preston Express. It could be on um, a road between two locations, a canal between two locations, um, or a line between two locations, or a named um, Liverpool London Canal, for example. So place names are really tricky in explaining those to the public to get the level of detail that we needed and could actually use was a very sort of iterative process in working out um, what data would be useful, how we would parse it, um, how we would process it, as well as what it's realistic to ask people to do when we don't know anything about their background. They might live in England and really understand English place names, or they could be a 12 year old in an American um, school doing an assignment and doing some volunteer hours. So it's a really challenging environment, but we found that people really engage with the questions. They want to do the right thing. Um, and I think the thing that I particularly loved is that people um, through this sort of repeated exposure really got a sense of the texture and the, um, the qualities of different newspapers, different reporting styles, as well as the um, sort of information about the accidents and the machines themselves involved in this work. Next slide, please, Casper. Okay, and now I'm going to pass it to Casper. Thank you. Thank you, Mia, for this very thorough overview of all the different strands of the project. And I will, in the next minutes, I will focus on like one specific uh, strand within the with machines. Um, and it's good to know in the background that the title Living with Machines was somehow ambiguous on purpose. It was about the 19th century experience, but also about maybe historians today, like how can historians today learn to live with the machines of today with this AI and also data. And one thing that we were very interested in, in investigating more is how we can actually learn more critically. How can we learn to work more critically with big heritage collections, big uh, data? And what I will be showing you is like one example of where we applied some ideas to the digitized uh, press, to digitized newspapers. So. To, to rephrase, we were very interested in like, how can we engage more quickly with, with, with big data, big historical data, and to kind of think more, more, how would we apply source criticism at scale? Like historians are often very good at source criticism in detail or qualitatively, but you cannot apply many of the methods when you are confronted with like a newspaper collection of 150 billion words. So how could we still be critical about this corpora without having to read everything closely? And we kind of divided it in more like sub questions. Um, so firstly, how can we understand the composition of and the contours of our historical collection? Uh, what is in there? What is not in there? And based on this, how representative is what we have? So can we actually make claims about the past given the data we have? Um, and then also going more to tying representativeness to bias, like how bias is our data set towards certain voices. And what, what I will be showing here is like a specific case study where we were very interested in the political bias of the British Victorian press. So there are many ways of looking at bias and many ways to conceptualize it, but I will mostly talk about how we can we tackle the problem of like political bias in the uh, newspaper, digitized newspapers. And just to show you that this is like the, the we work with data from um, the British Library newspapers, which are now hosted by Find My Past. And this is like, I think the more traditional way how historians would interact with digitized information or digitized newspapers is to, we have a search box, and from there, you, you try to find your, your, your information. So this is a quite easy way to, to get access to information, but it's also quite problematic because the interface hides, hides, quite, hides the complexity of the data to some extent. And especially when it's about newspapers, and Mia has already said, when, we, when you work with newspapers and many other collections, you're only looking at like a fairly opaque sample of a wider population of information. And it's very hard to know what is actually in there, what is not, not in there. So it's a very opaque pool of information. It's large, but even large data, like big data can still be biased in, in many ways. So we were more interested, like how can you kind of situate yourself in this kind of, when you work with historical newspapers, how can you, how can you get a better grasp of the contours of, of, of this collection and, and like situate yourself, like where, what am I looking at and what am I, for example, not looking at? Because you can't see what is not there necessarily when you work with historical collections. So this is a problem. We always face, and we would like to kind of do this more formally. Um, uh, like, can we kind of quant quantify what what the bias is, or what is not there? 
So just to rephrase, like the main problem we, we were tackling is like newspaper data, but it also applies to other, other types of information. It's like it's often an, an opaque pool of information. So we then more look closely like what can we can kind of articulate, like quantify political biases, and potentially also, also other biases in the in the Victorian press uh, as a diagnostic tool. And we can kind of slightly rephrase this question like, um, is the digitized press representative of the of, of of the press or of society as a whole? So again, like the digitized press is like a sample, but to what extent is this uh, sample represent representative, and of what does it represent? And our answer there was also with what she called a method called environmental scan, which is basically like re, re reconsidering the importance of of metadata, and what we, and we call it also radical contextualization. So basically, what we want to do. To do so contextualize big data in no, in no ways in, in no, novel ways that, that allow us to uh, quantify missingness like what is there what is not there understand what is present in the data and what is not present we also enrich uh, large collections of like newspapers with like metadata that goes beyond the traditional like metadata but also like we're very interested in contextualizing this historical data with historical metadata like the contemporaneous classifications like how did Victorians look at newspapers? How did how did, how did they classify the, the press? So this we were also interested in, in, in enriching this uh, corpus of digitized press with Victorian, we call, we can call it vintage or Victorian metadata. So th those were all our two main answers to, to the problem of bias, like quantify missingness, but also it's also required us to enrich data beyond the usual kind of categories. And when working with, with, with the British uh, press, we were quite, fortunate that we had access to like a very interesting resource which are called the press directories and this is a bit like that you could consider it an encyclopedia of newspapers so these are published each year and they have we're, we're like a fairly exhaustive list of, of the newspapers that circulated in britain it's not complete but it's somehow you could say it, it approximates the population of newspapers and we, could, we also say we also use a metaphor of landscape so we say that the uh, Press directories kind of depict the landscape of newspapers, like all the newspapers which are which are there are kind of cataloged in the in these uh, press direct press directories. And um, it's also good to know so these press directories were, were published yearly from from the mid eighteen fifties uh, onwards. So we have a yearly kind of snapshot of the newspaper landscape, and also contemporaneous. So they give a way of of, of knowing how the Victorians kind of classified or looked at the press. And, and this information is quite rich. So for example, here you, show, here you see one, one way uh, a newspaper is described in the press directory. So you, you can see it has a title, it says when, when it is published. But importantly, it also has like a political label. You see here the Chatham News is classified as independent. And this is something we will use later on in this presentation. Like we would look at the political labels as, the, as these directories classified the political leaning of the press. But also it has more information about where it circulates and how much it costs and so on. So it's a very, Rich description, and we spent a lot of time digitizing this. So we got the scans, and we kind of spent quite some time like converting the scans to structured data. I won't go into this process now, but it was very laborious. Also, we did this four years ago. I think today it would be easier, but four years ago it was quite a hard job to get this in a fairly nice and readable format. As you see, it, it was complicated. Like it, it these these there was a lot, a lot of. I historically, I, I just created fonts in those collections. So we took quite some time with a technical transfer learning to kind of convert those images to a structured representation. And so what we ended up with, so we, we digitized and we structured all those uh, press directories from 1846 to 1920. And basically what we ended up with is, is around 90,000 descriptions of newspapers. So it, it, it's a fairly like very rich. So we had like 90,000, uh, descriptions of, of a newspaper. So a newspaper can, can appear multiple, ti multiple times, but still it was a fairly big data set in this sense. So for, and from each description, we kind of extracted certain information like the political leaning, the price, the place, and so on. Also georeference, we also georeference all information in there. And here you see like a, a quick overview of what's in there. So it shows you the number of uh, descriptions per year in uh, we extracted from the press directories. So the x x the y axis shows you the number of descriptions. The what x axis is the year. So it shows you how many descriptions we have, how many titles there actually are in Britain over time. So going from five hundred to two thousand five hundred in the late nineteenth nineteenth century. And just to show you what you can do with this data, what we did, for example, is look at the political geography of the press. So again, we 
we can have looked at as, as where, where newspapers are published and we can we can try to see where are the liberal newspapers published where are the conservative ones the neutral or, or independent ones you can see in, in this case that like the how the different kind of political leanings are more are more dominant at other places in the country and this is information we could extract from these press directories data we could again it kind of describe the landscape the population of newspapers this is another one where we try to look at the at the information the the press as, as, as a network so we can have connected each place of publication with all the places where this where newspapers from this uh, from this place spread so it's connecting publication with circulation and you get have a bit of inf information network we can see what's the geographic reach of each, each place how are how are the spaces connected as a as an information network um and you can actually also play this data is available so you can go to to the which is like the research, research repository, which is shown here. And if you search here for press directories, you will find it and you can actually play with the data yourself. So again, so just to quickly rephrase, like the press directories were a way for us to describe the newspaper population or landscape. Okay, a sense what is, what's out there, what, what, what was what circulated in the 19th century. And what we then did to, to because we were interested in, is the digitized press represent, representative of this population. What we did is then also look at other sources. So we also had to look at the, uh, the metadata of the British newspaper archive. So this is the um, this is the digitized press. So we can have compared first of what we compared is what what, ex what has been digitized so far, and as you can see in in this plot, so the the dashed line shows you the the number of titles as they were recorded in the press directories, and the solid line are the number of titles in the uh, we we could find in the metadata. So we got all the newspapers from the British newspaper archive and then compared what percentage has been digitized. And we find around like 15, 16% has been digitized so far, um, which is shown by the solid line if you if you compare to the, the dashed line. And we also look, looked at the content of, 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 of the press. So we we also are making a corpus now where we kind of collect word counts. So, so far we think there are around 115 billion words in the, in the digitized press. And we can collect work counts for each month. So we will, I will look at this later, but we also look at bias, like in terms of composition, what's there, what's not there, but also we will look at, at bias in terms of content, like partisan language. And for this, we needed to, for now, we look, we look mostly at, at, the le at the word level. So we extracted like all the words, word counts from the uh, newspapers. So to go back to my main question. So we were interested in articulating political bias by answering the question, is the digitized press as a sample representative of the newspaper population? And firstly, what we did is we simply look at the, at the kind of type of labels that occur. So when I talked about politics or political leaning, we looked at the way if these Victorian press, direct, press directories classified the, the press. Uh, so this shows you like a distribution of all the political labels that appeared in those directories with Four categories were, were, were like very dominant, like the liberal, conservative, independent, and neutral uh, press. And there were some actually there, there were seventy different categories, so it was a fairly rich. Victorians could be pretty particular about how they could how they how they would locate themselves on a political scale, but largely there were like four dominant groups, and then some without a label or like religious. So we kind of simplified the labeling structure a bit to maintain the things. We were mostly looking at liberal, conservative, neutral, and, and independent press to quantify uh, bias. So one thing what we did first then is to is to just look how how did the press landscape change over time. So this here shows you the kind of proportion of uh, newspaper titles by political leaning over time as recorded in the press directories. For example, it tells you that at the early 1850s, around 40% of all the newspapers were uh, conservative. It's a blue line, and there was a dominance dominance of liberal press so far in the 19th century. Then kind of. Uh, degraded quite quickly. Interestingly, interestingly enough, there's a lot of, if not one of the biggest groups, if you would take them together, is a neutral or independent press, which actually we don't know much about. So, 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 so this was already an interesting finding for us. There was quite some, we, there are not so, no, not so much research as, for example, liberal or conservative press, but they constitute a very big part of the newspaper landscape. As you see here, these are indicated by the green and red lines. These are the neutral and independent press. So, to kind of quantify bias, what we did, what we would then do is to compare, let's say, the metadata of the digitized press, so the digitized newspapers, to with the press directories. This is shown in in this figure here. So, if you look at the the line with the with the, with the small triangles, 
they show you the, the, the proportion of 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 uh, of, of uh, titles in the directories and the the, the dash line shows you one in the digitized press. And then you, you can see like if, if those lines would be close to each other, they would actually uh they we would say that there's not so much bias. If if, if they're further from each other, we would say there's a there, there's more bias. So in this sense, we would talk about represent representativeness in the sense that to what extent does do the do these proportions match up? Are there proportionally equal number of conservative or liberal newspapers in the directories as there are in the digitized corpus? So more technically, we, we would use a measure of divergence. I, I won't go into detail now, but we would look at distribution of labels. The thing, the important thing is to know here that we would quantify it as a diversion uh, between like say the, the observed population and like what we would see the observed labels in the newspaper and the digitized samples and the population. And if the scores are higher, we would say we have more bias. So if there's more divergence between between the distribution in the digitized press and the press registries, we would have more bias. So this is not not, not really important. Just to, to say that the graphs I will show you would be, be measure bias as a in terms of divergence, and the higher the divergence, the higher the bias. So what we show what I'm showing here, and this is for now, you can only focus on like the line with the uh, triangles again. So basically, we try to, to see like to what extent is the digitized press represent, representative of the, um, the the population or the landscape, and it basically shows that that is also something that changes changes over time. For example, uh, the we for example observe like an increase in bias over over time. So the later the the we have more political bias in the later nineteenth century than than in the middle, for example, which probably also is related to the to the fact that. As a proportion of the total number of newspapers, we actually have less and less information because the newspaper landscape expanded expanded more expanded quicker than 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 the digitization. So um, so as a proportion, we actually have fewer newspapers of of the late nineteenth century. So also actually more political bias over time, which we can see as a as a fairly interesting diagnostic tool um, to 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 take into account when you do research with these large collections. And we could also kind of look at uh, which labels drive this bias. So how can we explain this bias? Um, how can we explain this course are going up or down? And we can look at which kind of political leanings contribute to, to this divergence. Um, so for example, what, what was interesting, what we generally found is that the digitized samples of the corpus of digitized newspaper tends to be more, more partisan. So there's a higher emphasis on like political press than you would expect from, from looking at the directories. And so the liberal and conservative press of voices will be overrepresented, while the, the neutral or independent press would tend to be underrepresented, which thinking, which maybe resembles more the interests of historians than the interests of Victorian readers, which because we know that Victorian readers were actually very interested in, in the local press, which which were often categorized as neutral or, or independent. So there's a bit of a divergence between what, hist what, what historians might have read and what historians what, what Victorians might have read and what historians thought it was interesting to, to digitize. So firstly, we find it was like a, quite, a, quite an emphasis on political press when selecting papers for digitization. And we've also been looking at, at how, to, how does this uh, bias um, change as a function of digitization time. So until now, I have looked, we have looked at how bias changes over historical time, like it, there was more bias at the end of the 19th century but you're also interested, like how when you add more more, more data to, to to digitized corpus, how does it influence the bias measure, and has the bias changed overall as as the corpus grows? Um, and this was particularly interesting for us because we know there have been different digitization incentives and dig digitization projects. So again, the corpus of digitized press is a very very complex thing. Like there are many partners involved, different institutions, so it, it's quite a hybrid construct. So we want to see how have these digitization priorities changed over time as the corpus grew. So what we did basically, and this is, uh, I will, you don't have, have to worry about the details here again, but we, we would look at digitization batches. So for example, if you have a corpus of um, four, five newspapers, as, as seen here, we would, for example, we would look at, 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 at each batch. So if we would take the first two, measure the bias, then we would take the second and third uh, newspapers, measure the bias, and then the, the third and fourth. So we would look at, at each batch and measure the bias, and then we can see how this how the bias changes as a function of, of, of corpus growth, basically. 
And what was fairly interesting for us to see here, if you see in this plot, the uh, the gray, the, the shaded area, these are kind of early digitization initiatives, which were predominantly guided by academic interest. So they were when JISC and Gale uh, digitized newspapers, predominantly catering towards academic research. And we found that in these uh, phases of the digitization, there was a lot of emphasis on the conservative and liberal press. Again, there was a, a focus on partisan newspapers, uh, a partisan um, bias to, to, to say. And when and then later Find My Past takes over, which is a company which has more interest in family history and genealogy and also has more commercial interest in, 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 in those newspapers. And then we actually saw that, that, that their, their focus was totally different. They would digitize way more neutral and, and independent papers, which was uh, somehow corrected for the biases which are present in the, in the academic corpus, which was quite an interesting uh, finding. But it, just to see that, that those corpus are never neutral. And even like you can see how different digitization initiatives shape the corpus in different ways, which is not always easy to know as, as, as a researcher. In my very last part, and uh, just a few minutes, I will talk about uh, our content analysis. So we were so far, I mostly talked, is the corpus representative? And the question is no, and the answer is no. And um, did the, um, so we will look more at the contours of the corpus. And now uh, we also look more at the content. We were interested in the partisanship in the language, like to what extent do new, our newspapers partisan in, in the language that they deploy? So we would look at, at the at the word counts. So basically we would mostly look at, we would try to find words that, that, that discriminate between the categories, that discriminate liberal from everything else. So we would look at, at words that discriminate between categories are prevalent within the category and persistent over time. And we would say if, if, if a word matches those three criteria, we'd say it's a partisan word. Um, I won't go into the details here about the algorithm thing, but just to know this is this was our intuition when we want to measure partisanship. We want to have words that are discriminative between categories, prevalent or, uh, within the category and persistent over time. So, for example, if you would look at the ten most liberal words, so these are the, the method can kind of show those words as being the ten most liberal words. You can see this very this very kind of even quite, quite adversarial language. Like Tory is the most liberal word followed by liberals and uh, and reform. So there's a, like a mix of identification and altruification, like we and they was, was very strong in this uh, liberal uh, li liberal press. So 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 this gives you an overview of, of the kind of the most conservative versus the most radical uh, liberal words. So the orange ones are liberals, the blue ones are conservative. And again, I think this is also something as a digital historian, like this is kind of maybe not totally unexpected, but I still think what we can do with this method is kind of measure the strength of, of, of those partnership. And so it, it's maybe not, not a new finding, but still it, it's a finding that, that, that makes sense. I can sort of guide us in, into more deeper analysis of how the bias suppressed was over time. So one thing we found is that the the liberal press is more partisan in times of conservative uh, government and vice versa. So we would find that those words tend to fluctuate as well over time. And also we we grouped, so we computed the, the, the 200 most liberal, conservative, neutral and independent words, and we would group them into categories, again, to see what, what is, which is a different emphasis of those newspapers. And this again leads to obvious findings, also more interesting ones, which, which require further kind of uh, investigation, for example, like religion was very a very conservative topic, but actually also a very liberal topic. Um, and economy was like quite evenly shared across different categories. So this again is is, is like a, an intuitive finding, but I think it's so interesting from from a digital history history perspective, and it gives us a way to quantify the the partisan imprint on the press uh, as a overall. Uh, I think I will leave it at this. So. The conclusions for for this part is is, is, is that, firstly, we, we would like to look look at the press as as, as a digital, digitized press as giving a specific perspective on on history, and we try to quantify or try to articulate this perspective. And we found that when you when you use digitized press, you it tends to be more partisan than you might expect. Um, and so this is nice as a diagnostic toolkit. Um, we also could, could see how different digitization priorities 
different digitization efforts have different priorities, which are also reflected in, in, in the corpus. It is, again, this big data is, is a hybrid thing. And also how this partisanship, it's, 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 uh, it's, very, it's present and but it also fluctuates over time. So I think this is my part. So are there any questions?